Okay, so we're in unit seven. We're going to be talking about materials. Construction materials, types, and uses. So what are our objectives? Identify a variety of basic materials used in construction. Identify the basic components of concrete. We're going to talk about different types of masonry or masonry units, brick and block and mortar. We're going to look at wood, whether it's a hardwood or a softwood. We're going to look at different steel shapes, glass, insulation. And we'll wrap up. It'll be it'll be Thursday before we get around to looking at symbols. Uh, fundamentals of green building construction. I am actually going to tackle later in the semester. Um, I did leave a I did leave a slack week at the end of the semester for special topics. So um, green construction is is certainly one of those special topics. So we'll talk about that in more detail hopefully, um, at the end of the class. So that's our, that's our uh, marching orders for today. So Division 31, Earthwork, Earthwork, excuse me. <clears throat> so aggregates, sometimes referred to as gravel, right? We use gravel in many types of applications in a support backfill uh, to, to put around underground drainage pipes for fill and as an ingredient in concrete. Right, we have different classifications of aggregates. So pea gravel, uh, river gravel or crushed stone. Again, the drawing will, or specifications will call out those different types of aggregates. Right, so again, in this case, different symbols on the drawings show the different types of aggregate that will be applied in certain situations. And again, remember, you know, if you're the contractor and it's your responsibility to build based on these drawings, remember you're looking at the, both the drawings and the specifications because drawings and specifications put together are the construction documents that define what it is that you're to be building. Right, this is, uh, sorry, some of these pictures come out a little fuzzy when you're, when you're cutting and pasting and clipping, but yeah, different types of aggregate sand, the pea gravel, gravel. Again, the specifications will call this out and your material supplier will, we should know what you want when you ask them for pea gravel versus gravel. Right, again, another slide, different sizes and types of aggregates. Oops, uh, sorry, this is coming up. I don't know why things come out sideways sometimes. Um, I'll put these slides back up, but again, what I was trying to show here, this was a, a infill house under construction in my neighborhood a couple of years ago and I, I uh, walked by and took pictures every couple of days showing various stages of construction. What I was trying to show here, this is the this is the foundation wall. You can see the lines of the formwork on the concrete foundation. But what I was trying to show here was the the compacted gravel that will be ultimately underneath the basement floor slab. 
right? They're going to pour a slab on top of that compacted gravel. So that's an example of where aggregate would be used. I do these as PDFs, and that's supposed to prevent mishaps like this, but it's obviously not foolproof. Okay, uh, division three, again, I, I have this lecture organized as does the textbook by the different divisions of the um, CSI or Construction Specification Institute, the divisions that work, that specifications are, are organized by. So concrete is a building material that's been around for a long time, right? Used by the Romans as early as a thousand years BC. Concrete is a mixture of cement, sand, aggregates, and water. So as you see, they, we sometimes use the terms concrete and cement inter interchangeably, but they're really two different things. Cement is a component, one of the four major components of, con of uh, concrete. The hardening of concrete is caused by a chemical reaction between the cement and the water. Depending on the way the uh, concrete is mixed, how much water it is, depending on the temperature. You know, most mixtures will set up in, as it says here, four to 12 hours, right? So when you were a kid, if you saw them, you know, pouring a, Pouring a new sidewalk on on your streets, you might run out and put your initials into the into the sidewalk, uh, but you only have a, a couple hours to do that before the concrete is set up enough that you can no longer carve your initials in there easily. Uh, as we shall see, it does not the concrete doesn't come to full strength in 12 hours, but it is. Um, you know, within a couple hours, it's probably set enough that you can't work it any longer. And concrete is typically held in place by forms. So concrete is a, is a pourable, let's say plastic material. Plastic means it's flexible. So we have to create form work and then use that form work to hold the concrete in place while it is setting up. Right, so the, the process of hydration, the setting up of the concrete is dependent on temperature, right? So there's gonna be times when it's hard to pour concrete. Obviously it's gonna be very hard to pour concrete when it's below freezing. And it's gonna be hard to pour concrete when it's really hot outside because that concrete is gonna set up quickly. So again, we have, um, we have ways of addressing those two issues. Uh, I think in our, in our uh, table a couple of weeks ago, we, we saw water to cement ratio. And I'll show you a video here in just a minute that talks about that, but too much water reduces the strength of the concrete. We have a trade-off here between strength of the concrete and the ease that the concrete can be poured. So like lots of things in, in construction, there are trade-offs. The contractor or you, if you're the contractor, you'll have to choose how to balance those, those factors in determining the mix of the concrete that you want. Most placements reach design strength within 28 days. That's kind of a standard for concrete. Forms may be removed after the concrete sets. So um, generally speaking, the, the forms will be removed or you strike the forms. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna wait 28 days to strike the forms. You'll probably strike the forms after three or four days. However, the concrete will not have reached its full strength until that 28 day mark, give or take.
right? One thing, uh, these little slides say green building, right? Ways that, that um, people in our business have found to reduce the environmental impacts of, of concrete um, is to put fly ash in there. Fly ash is a, is a waste product that's produced when coal is burned in an electrical generating plant. Right, we can, in some cases, use that fly ash as one of the components of our concrete. So we are taking a waste product and putting it to good use. And I'm, uh, I'm making a note here. Um, as I remember seeing an article a couple of months ago about uh, greener or more environmentally sound methods of concrete, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, put that up on Blackboard for you guys to look at. Right. So again, this is out of the textbook, kind of basic types of concrete type one normal portland cement being the most commonly used so where does cement come from right remember that cement and concrete are not the same thing cement is made by quarrying or digging various things out of the ground, limestone, shale, silica, right? Those are quarried or dug up from the ground. They're crushed, mixed together, and heat is applied to them, right? Heat produces a chemical reaction in that limestone. And, and then from there, we grind it up and bag it into Portland cement. Um, again, cement production is a, uh, we won't talk about it much in this class, but in my 110 class, ARC 110 class, we talk about carbon emissions and sources of carbon emissions. You know, cement production is a, is a large source of carbon or CO2 emissions, right? CO2 emissions are, are driving global climate change. So production of cement is a, is uh, probably if cement was a country, it's probably number, number three or number four in terms of um, greenhouse gases, CO2. However, you know, the flip side of that is that using cement to make concrete makes for durable, long lasting buildings. So um, those two things need to be balanced. So again, we're quarrying materials, dig them out of the ground, processing them to produce the cement. Again, it's the, it's the reaction between cement and water, the hydration that hardens that concrete. So again, here's another view of cement production and concrete production. I show the two of them side by side just to, re to remind you that cement and concrete are not the same thing. Cement, we're digging stuff out of the ground and we are grinding it up and heating it. And then concrete again is coming from our four basic components, cement, water, and sand and aggregate. Right here's another view of, of the components of what might be in concrete. And we are going to watch a quick video here. So let me find that. Sorry.
Concrete is as much part of the urban landscape as trees are to a forest. It's so ubiquitous that we rarely give it any regard at all. But underneath that drab gray exterior is a hidden world of complexity. Hey, I'm Grady, and this is Practical Engineering. On today's episode, it's Concrete 101. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on that later. Concrete is one of the most versatile and widely used construction materials on Earth. It's strong, durable, low maintenance, fire resistant, simple to use, and can be made to fit any size or shape, from the unfathomably massive to the humble stepping stone. However, none of those advantages would matter without this. It's cheap. Compared to other materials, concrete is a bargain, and it's easy to see why if we look at what it's made of. Concrete has four primary ingredients. Water, sand, also called fine aggregate, gravel, aka coarse aggregate, and cement. A recipe that is not quite a paragon of sophistication. One ingredient falls from the sky, and the rest come essentially straight out of the ground. But from these humble beginnings are born essentially the basis of the entire world's infrastructure. Actually, of the four, cement is the only ingredient in concrete with any complexity at all. The most common type used in concrete is known as Portland cement. It's made by putting quarried materials, mainly limestone, into a kiln, then grinding them into a fine powder with a few extra herbs and spices. Cement is a key constituent in a whole host of construction materials, including grout, mortar, stucco, and of course, concrete. A lot of people don't know this, but every time you say cement when you're actually talking about concrete, a civil engineer's calculator runs out of batteries. I'm just kidding, of course, and you can hardly be blamed for not knowing the difference if you've never mixed up a batch of concrete before. Even if you have mixed some concrete, good chance it was in a ready mix bag where all the ingredients were already portioned together. But each ingredient in concrete has a specific role to play, and cement's role is to turn the concrete from a liquid to a solid. Portland cement cures not through drying or evaporation of the water, but through a chemical reaction called hydration. The water actually becomes a part of the cured concrete. This is why you shouldn't let concrete dry out while it's cured. Lack of water can prematurely stop the hydration process, preventing the concrete from reaching its full strength. In fact, as long as you avoid washing out the cement, concrete made with Portland cement can be placed and cured completely underwater. It will set and harden just as well, and maybe even better, as if it were placed in the dry. But you may be wondering, if water plus cement equals hard, what's the need for the aggregate? To answer that question, let's take a closer look by cutting the sample through with a diamond blade. Under a macro lens, it starts to become obvious how the individual constituents contribute to the concrete. Notice how the cement paste filled the gaps between the fine and coarse aggregate. It serves as a binder, holding the other ingredients together. You don't build structures from pure cement the same way you don't build furniture exclusively out of wood glue. Instead, we use cheaper filler materials, gravel and sand, to make up the bulk of the concrete's volume. This saves costs, but the aggregates also improve the structural properties of the concrete by increasing strength and reducing the amount of shrinkage as the concrete cures. The reason that civil engineers and concrete professionals need to be pedantic about the difference between cement and concrete is this. Even though the fundamental recipe for concrete is fairly simple with its four ingredients, there is a tremendous amount of complexity involved in selecting the exact quantities and characteristics of those ingredients. In fact, the process of developing a specific concrete formula is called mix design. And I love that terminology because it communicates just how much effort can go into developing a concrete formula that has the traits and characteristics needed for a specific application. One of the most obvious knobs that you can turn on a mix design is how much water is included. Obviously, the more water you add to your concrete, the easier it flows into the forms. This can make a big difference to the people who are placing it. But this added workability comes at a cost to the concrete strength. To demonstrate this balancing act, I'm mixing up some ready mix concrete with different amounts of water. For the first sample, I'm using just enough water to wet the mix. You can see it's extremely dry. A mix like this is certainly not going to flow into the forms very easily, but you can compact it into place. 
In fact, dry concrete mixes like this are used in roller compacted concrete, which is a common material in the construction of dams. For the next three samples, I use increasing amounts of water up to what is pretty much concrete soup. After the concrete has had a week to cure, I cut the samples out of the molds. It's time to see how strong they are. This is actually more or less how concrete is tested for compressive strength in construction projects. Obviously, I'm not running a testing lab here in my garage, but I think this will give us good enough results to illustrate how water content affects concrete strength. Plus, these cylinders look like they might attack at any time, and we need to deal with them. There's a terrible curse that plagues guitar players once they reach the intermediate stage. I call it guitar playing limbo. It's I made three cylinders of each mix, and I'll break each one, watching how much pressure the cylinder was applying at the moment of failure. And this experiment was too cool not to invite my neighbors over to help. We started with the samples that used the most water. It was no surprise that it took almost no pressure at all to break, on average, about 700 psi, or 5 megapascals. You can see how crumbly the concrete is even after having a week to cure. All that water just diluted the cement paste too much. The next two samples use the range of water suggested on the pre-mixed concrete bag. These were much stronger, breaking at an average of 1600 and 2200 psi, or 11 and 15 megapascals, for the high and low end of the water content range. And you can really see the difference in how the concrete breaks. Finally, we broke the samples with the least water added to the mix. You can see how rough these samples were because there wasn't enough water for the concrete to flow smoothly into the molds. But despite looking the worst of the four, these were the strongest samples of all, breaking at an average of around 3,000 psi or 20 megapascals. On this shot, you can even see the crack propagating through the cylinder before it fails. It just goes to show how important mix design can be to the properties of concrete. Even varying the water content by a small amount can have a major impact on the strength, not to mention the workability and even the finished appearance of the concrete. It's impossible to say just how much I'm scratching the surface here. There is so much complexity to the topic of concrete, partly because it has so many applications, from skyscrapers to canoes and everything in between. In fact, no matter where you are, you're rarely more than a few feet from concrete, a fact that is inexplicably a source of great comfort to me. But I took less than 10 minutes to describe what is literally the foundation of our modern society. So I'm dedicating at least the next few videos to dive deeper into the topic of concrete. The next video will be about its greatest weakness. If you've got questions about concrete, put them down below in the comments and maybe I can get them incorporated into the next videos. Thank you for watching, and let me know what you think. If you're watching my videos, you probably share my passion for understanding how things work and wanting to apply them. Okay, we will... Uh... We'll bypass the advertisements here. I guess that's always... Uh... What happens when you're doing stuff on YouTube or finding information on YouTube? Let me uh, go back and see where I was. All right, so again, in the textbook. All right, we've talked about the various the four basic components of concrete, right? Cement, water, sand, or fine aggregates, and gravel, or coarse aggregates, right? There are gonna be other things that we can put in there, add mixtures to fine tune the properties of that concrete. Retarders will slow down the process of of uh, the concrete setting accelerators will speed up the process of setting of the concrete setting up we can do things in there with the water and obviously we can add color to the concrete i remember we had this uh we had this uh table 
a couple weeks ago in our activity on specifications and uh, some of you had questions about it which I thought I answered but um, right in this case in the specifications it talked about these different mixes that are being applied in different parts of the building again here's our here's our strength at 28 days I don't know why this one is 56 days right the amount of Portland cement in the concrete mix now we know the difference between cement and concrete uh, and let me go to the next slide here where I explain some of that stuff a little bit more right here's our water to cement ratio as we just saw a lower ratio leads to higher strength and durability but may make the mix difficult to work with and form right so less water higher strength less water more difficult to work with a trade-off uh, chloride is an accelerator right an accelerator causes that concrete to set faster and reach its strength sooner right air entrainment is something that you use uh, again, that's a, a thing that's added to concrete as well. Right, concrete, you saw in the video there, them squeezing or compressing concrete, right? Concrete has great compressive strength, but poor tensile strength. We'll see what that means in, on the next slide here. So quite often we we add reinforcing with steel to the concrete to produce reinforced concrete. Reinforcing with steel overcomes weak tensile strength. The, the deformations, the shape of that, the shaping of that rebar or reinforcement strengthens the bonding with the concrete. And they get that rebar, that mesh will be set in place inside the forms before we pour the concrete. So just a reminder, right? Compression, concrete by, you know, compression is squeezing something together. So concrete on its own does great with compressive forces. Tension is stretching something out. Again, uh, concrete does very poorly with tensile or stretching forces but adding steel rebar reinforcement in there proves the tensile strength of concrete yes go ahead please was there a question <clears throat> so adding adding rebar, adding steel, steel works great in tension. So adding reinforcement to the concrete improves its tensile strength and its resistance to shear. Shear would be side to side forces. Right, so again, reinforced concrete would be a combination of form work, and steel reinforcement um, let's do this it's five minutes to the hour i need to rest my voice for a minute so let's take a 10 minute break and we will convene again at five minutes after the hour <laughs> 